reading for Je- from Genesis 21, 1 through 3, and 22, 1 through 14. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. Then some time passes. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship Then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, the fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be, shall provi- it shall be provided. I can almost guarantee that I'm going to leave this down here, so... Help me remember that this is it's hiding. I'm going to take a second to move this up. Something like that. Uh, it's not in my sermon, but I was struck as you read that. And I wish sometimes that in Bible study we could just read the same passage like 15 times together. Like, no one would sign up for that, but I think it's so helpful to just hear the same words over and over again. You just notice something different every time. And I notice the repeated phrase, here I am. God calls to Abraham, here I am. Isaac calls to Abraham, here I am. The angel calls out, here I am. There's definitely something there. I'm not going to talk anymore about it. (coughs) So in this story, this just so... uh, straightforward and easy story. Abraham has lived a long life. Supposedly, he is about 75 when God makes his first promise to then Abram and then Sarai, uh, later becoming Abraham. He says that uh, God will bless Abram, give him so many descendants, it'll be like the sands on the beach, like the stars in the sky, just Countless descendants. He's 75. But the journey to receiving that promise took another 25 years. And so along the way, 
they remember the promise and they think maybe God is calling us to do our part. Sarai is barren. Let's do something else. Let's change it up. And so <laughs> Sarai uh, says, how about you hook up with my servant, Hagar? Abram's like, yeah, that sounds sweet. And so they have a kid, but of course Sarai is jealous, and uh, Hagar takes off with her son Ishmael. It's a crazy story, not the point of the sermon, just really important to know. So eventually Sarai is renamed Sarah, and Abram is Abraham, and Sarah conceives and gives birth to Isaac. So that only took, uh, was it nine chapters in the Bible? But I'm sure that felt like way longer for them. And now that they have their promised heir, God tests Abraham by telling him to sacrifice Isaac on a mountain in the region of Moria, which makes me think of Mordor. And guess what? He does it. Well, I mean, he does it, but he doesn't really do it. He's just willing to do it. So humor me this one little aside before we get to our main course, maybe an appetizer, some rolls before the actual meal comes out. It's just very interesting to me that God can do this, that God can test someone while using someone else in a negative fashion. It's one thing to have pained uh, Abraham to sacrifice his only son, but the trauma that Isaac must have experienced, I, I literally cannot fathom that. He has no power in the story. He's simply a tool. He does at least get a voice, I suppose, which is more than can be said for many Bible characters. But the story never actually shifts to Isaac at this point in his life to explore the ramifications of what has happened. And so I imagine uh, eventually it would be the boy and the father grew apart for the boy feared his father. That would be its own lesson. That's not what we get. Instead, we get a little bit of a glimpse into the rest of Isaac's life, mostly to set up Jacob's story, because Jacob apparently is the most important. But for now, uh, after all this happens, they simply go on as planned to Beersheba like nothing happened. I just think that's really interesting that God can not only test us, but test us using someone else, at least as the story goes. So anyway, now that Abraham has shown his fearful obedience because he did not withhold his only son, God, through an angel, which I also find interesting but won't get into, God, through an angel, says Abraham's descendants will be as numerous as the stars and with all the nations of the earth will be blessed because he obeyed God. But wait a minute. These exact words is what started the whole Abram story. It goes, uh, 10 chapters back, it goes, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse the ones who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that was 10 chapters earlier, and there's no qualification. God just says, I will do this. And up to this point, Abraham, Abram, man, it's hard, has done nothing up to this point other than marry Sarai, which we know is barren. So as I've reread many of the stories in the Old Testament, I found it fascinating as well that each story tends to have some sort of summary statement at the end, some sort of neat little bow that ties it all together and gives, this is why I just heard that story. Here are a few examples. We know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We know terrible things that have come from that story in our present reality, specifically against the LGBTQ plus community. But when we read the whole thing and we get to the tail end of the narrative, we see that Lot, still terrible, but Lot is raped by his children and impregnates both of his daughters. So each daughter gives birth to a son, and each son is given a very familiar name to the Israelites, uh, Moab and then Ami. And they end up being the fathers of the Moabites and the Ammonites today 
as it says at the end of the passage. So uh, today, of course, meaning the time of the writer or the editor or the compiler, when the texts were uh, formed together. <clears throat> we see at this time, whenever it's being written or edited or compiled, that Israel is not friends with Moab or Ammon. And so the story of Sodom and Gomorrah actually is the origin story of Israel's neighboring enemies, that they were born from incest, from drunken incest. Not good people, don't trust them, not good. So likewise, we can see the flood and all of its terrifying glory and theology, and we can maybe see that it explains rainbows. That's why those colored things are in the sky. That's at the end. And toward the beginning, actually, we see it kind of explains why there's giants or really tall people. And the Tower of Babel tries to explain why there's various languages, and the first creation story gives us a brilliant envisioning of the beginning of time and space, while also giving us a reason to observe the Sabbath. That's kind of the point. And the second tells us why death is a reality. So now as I read this kind of bizarre story of Abraham's obedience even to kill his own son, I find not one, but two summary statements toward the end of it, bringing it all together kind of nicely. <clears throat> the, first verse, or the first of these verses is 16 through 18, where the angel of God says, because you have done this and not withheld your son, dot, 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 because there's more words, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So as we see over and over again throughout the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, God wants to bless God's people in order that they might be a blessing, but they keep screwing up. God wants to bless, and we started with a blanket statement for Abram in Genesis 12, and now, at the end of the story, there's a clause attached. It's because he has obeyed that this is going to come to pass. So Abraham obeyed and was rewarded, whereas Israel keeps failing and is thus punished, or at least is not rewarded, depending on when you're reading it. But the real point is the second one, I think, which comes a little before that. <clears throat> we see that a ram is offered in place of Isaac in verse 13. I think that many readers, when they read the binding of Isaac, as it's often called, are off-put by the mere request from God to Abraham to sacrifice his son. But the truth of the story is that ultimately he prohibits Abraham from doing it. So if we remember, Alice hinted at this a little bit last week, scholarship is finding that these ancient texts were probably being formed sometime during or even after the monarchical period, sometime during the reign of David and Solomon. And that's not to say that these stories could not have been passed down orally or been important to them before this, but this is kind of when they're coming together. We see uh, imagery and language about priests and all sorts of things that were a little anachronistic for when the actual stories took place. <clears throat> so we'll probably unpack those ideas a little bit more as uh, the sermon series continues. But for now, if it is true that these stories are being either edited or compiled during this time of the monarchy, and perhaps even after exile, it seems that Israel would use this powerful force of their ancestry to make a claim about their surrounding nations of the time, to bring the past into the present. We see this very often in the Bible, and it's a very powerful uh, form of theology. And we see that God does not allow child sacrifice. We don't know exactly whether the Israelites themselves were performing child sacrifice or if it was just the norm of the surrounding countries and nations. But the author of this story of God providing a substitute for Isaac is clearly speaking out against the practice of child sacrifice, <coughs> not condoning it. Kind of begs the question of what might God be speaking out against today? I see God calling us to make a stand against injustice, against economic inequality, racial, gender, and social biases. And yes, I see this in culture. And I believe that God is always acting in culture. I've heard some people argue that um, 
if you are okay with homosexuality or if you're giving handouts to people that don't deserve it, we need to stand firm, stand against culture, against change, because God never changes and we are called to be countercultural. And in a sense, I, I get the counterculturalness of it. I do believe that Christianity is a countercultural movement. I just don't think that it's a reactionary movement. I think we're called to move culture forward toward God's kingdom. And that culture is always changing, but God's truth remains the same. So God's kingdom and the qualities therein remain the same, and we call them toward it, into the kingdom of God. And we read throughout scriptures that the kingdom of God is like someone who sowed good seed, or like a mustard seed, or leaven, or hidden treasure in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, in the Sermon of the Mount, we see that Jesus says that blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. These are countercultural statements. Countercultural beliefs. And what does Jesus say that he came for? He says that he comes to declare good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. To set the oppressed free, not to oppress the poor, the sick, the needy, the different, the ostracized, and those who are already oppressed, that is not what Jesus came for. So likewise, how might God be testing us like God tested Abraham? What I believe is so obvious, ingrained in the very marrow of our faith, the deepest parts, it's loving our neighbor. It's sharing our wealth and doing unto others as we would want them to do to us. Maybe the test is already over and we failed. At least in America, I mean, where Christians were once the voice of reason and progress and truth and love, I honestly see a lot of fear and anger, hatred and selfishness. And don't get me wrong, I know that I'm speaking to lovely people and people that want to express this love and be compassionate and wise and to be good leaven and good seed to bring about the kingdom of God. But I speak from experience how much more difficult it is to be Christ-like than me-like. And I'm merely calling attention to ongoing trends that I see in our country, trends that have only become more apparent during the pandemic. So what did God want from Abraham in the first place? To kill his son? I guess those words were technically spoken, but we also know the end. We know the whole story, and we know that God provides a ram and ordered Abraham not to lay a hand on Isaac. So was the test actually to be obedient, or might it have been to reject the request outright? Do you think that God really wanted a relationship like we see in later prophets and leaders like Moses, one that would stand against God and say, no, I will not do what you ask. And that got me to think about sacrifice. And we see that the first sacrifice in the Bible is the story of Cain and Abel. Cain brings God offering a plants, whereas Abel brings the fat portions of the firstborn of his flock. We see this in Genesis 4.4, 4, if you want to check it out. Our conversation is not necessarily about this passage, but a few thoughts before we move on. Of course, the most obvious between the difference of Cain and Abel's sacrifice is that Cain's is plants and Abel's is an animal. But depending on your translations and your personal experience with uh, animal fat, it says that Abel brings the best portions of the firstborn of his flock, whereas Cain simply brings some of his crops. Well, it does appear, as we continue to read the Bible, that the writers seem to feel that God does, in fact, enjoy these animal, animal sacrifices. But I don't think that's wholly true either, because uh, I'm going to cherry pick some verses. I know that that doesn't really solve anything, and uh, we can do that on the other side too. But I just want you to know that it's in the Bible during these verses. So I'm going to read some out. 
1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the voice of God? Surely to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Psalm 51, 16 and 17, For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I have a few others, but I think that gets the point across. Here we go. So these are just a few examples uh, offering the perspective that sacrifice was never really truly the intent or the desire of God. So perhaps we understood this uh, first sacrifice and its importance as being an animal sacrifice rather than the fact that Abel offered what was best of what he had. God wants our best, not to throw some shaft away that we can't use ourselves uh, not some last-minute afterthought prayer before we sit down to take a test or join an important meeting. God wants our very best. And so we turn back to Abraham and his offering of Isaac to God. We see that truly God wants all of Abraham and not the death of his son. And I can't think about all of this son language and sacrifice language without thinking about Jesus. I get in trouble for that sometimes because we're in the Old Testament and Jesus isn't explicitly there, but it's just, it's, it is, it's there. It's incredible. So follow me for a second. <clears throat> what about Jesus? Both Isaac and Jesus are beloved sons who have been long awaited and have miraculous birthing circumstances. Both sons carry the wood that is to be the instrument of their death on their backs in both cases, the father leads the son, and the son follows obediently toward their own death. And in both cases, God provides the sacrifice. Abraham tells his son that God will provide the lamb. But in Genesis twenty-two thirteen, it's a ram that is provided. I may have to say this a few times, and I know we're not a shouting church, but it's okay if you get a little excited about it, because it's pretty exciting stuff kind of shattered my mind as, as Abraham and Isaac are on their way to make the altar, Isaac asks, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, God will provide the lamb. But when he looks up, as the angel tells him to spare his child, he sees a ram in the thicket. The lamb was still to come. The lamb was still to come. There was a ram provided but Abraham says a lamb will be provided by God. So the lamb was still to come. Jesus, also an innocent son, went willingly up the mountain to be crucified. But God does not make the sacrifice. He merely provides it, the lamb of God. Jesus is the lamb. Hallelujah, Jesus is the lamb. God provides the sacrifice. And unfortunately, we are the ones that make it. Humans are the ones who do not stay their hand, and this time God allows it. Not because God wants blood, but because we do. God sent his son to save the world. We know that in our basically most famous verse, John 3, 16. But John keeps going, and he reminds us in verse 19 that this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people have loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Light exposes light illuminates and it seems that we as a society have been doing a lot of illuminating recently people again through culture 
have exposed systems that were put in place to give or to suppress opportunity for superficial and inhumane reasons. People, through culture, have exposed patterns of behavior that once appeared mundane and acceptable to really be offensive and dehumanizing. People, through culture, are reminding us that love is the answer. So as the church, I pray that we know that our God is love. And may we affirm the ancient mandate that we should love one another as Christ loved us. May it be so. Amen.